Shortcuts with Sam Furstenberg. You know, Canon, for whatever their faults may have been, and you know, they may have done some things wrong, and things, but they, they gave people chances of all different kinds. They, they brought them in and said, hey, you know, yeah. let's do this. The same thing, right? And they were also uh, international so, uh, sales organization, remember? They, in their mind, the, the American movie industry, the Hollywood movie industry, in if you go back to the 50s or the 60s, they didn't consider the world as a potential market. They made movies for North America, Canadians and Americans, that's it. They didn't care, okay, they sold the movie in France, they sold the movie in Germany, but it was not, not like today. Mm-hmm. Canon looked at the entire world as a market, as a potential market. So they didn't want to make movies, movies which are too Americans or too French. Or too, they wanted to sell the movies all over the place, all over the world, which they did. That's that's yeah. how the, the company operated. And maybe that's why, as you say, they gave chances to everybody. They, say, okay, a few. they remind me of the Italians in that sense, just in the... Uh... You know, the Italians were making the spaghetti Western, selling them all over the world. Like, you know, uh, Canon was making the American propaganda movies. And it reminds me of, you know, sort of the spaghetti Westerns. No, they were distributing, exactly, you know. You're absolutely right. It's spaghetti movie. They yeah. made the movie with the American flavor because it sells more. It sells sure. better. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we went to the Philippines to make a, the movie American Ninja. We set it up in an American base to have this American look, so it, sure. because it sounds better. No, no question about it. No. You make a movie about some in small the... village in Africa, nobody cares. <laughs> I I guess the, uh, in the mainstream, yeah, Hollywood, yeah. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you're right. I made one movie well, about Ebola in Africa in a village, and the crew comes and saves them. Nobody cares about saving a small village in Africa. For well, it has to be Blood Diamond with, you know, with... Uh, uh, yeah, it, yeah. it has to be a big movie with big DiCaprio movie. in it. You know, it's got to be that uh, kind of thing. But otherwise, it has to have the palm sure. trees. You know, I went to film school undergraduate and graduate and and there is something about this period of time when you're young and you have a chance to to do uh, to learn to to learn all the different crops of movie making and to have a chance to do it i was a grip i was in electricity i was in an art department so it's very nice later on of course i was a director i didn't have any more chance to to to, to push a dolly or to to lay down cables for lighting anymore or editing but I, I know it. I, I was there. I, 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 I did it. I studied it. So it's nice to be with this kind of vast knowledge and to appreciate what people are doing. So you, yeah, you might have a director who never did any. You know, all he knows is to come to the set and direct. And maybe he, it will be harder for him to appreciate what you're doing. But you know, I did a lot. I volunteered. I worked in so many movies when I was young in yeah. other people's movies. And, Oh, by so, the way, I've been enjoying your uh, AD you. work. I watched uh, uh, I watched Lepke, I watched um, Diamonds, and I watched uh, Operation Thunderbolt, and I thought they were all great. And uh, and we want to talk about all that at some we point. We can talk about Lepke. I was a coffee boy, <laughs> basically. <laughs> you painted. I was, bringing, paint? I was bringing coffee to the people, basically. Didn't you paint signs too? Go for. I was. Uh, I was officially. I worked in the art department. But I did, you know. Unofficially, I brought coffee. I was curious, so I, I was, <laughs> I did, I, without being asked, I did many other things. Sure. But officially, I was in the art department. I was part of pushing, the pushing things around on set. Yeah, but but art department, you know, dressing, uh, whatever. I was not art director, of course. It was working, you know, <laughs> whatever assignment they yeah. they give me. Yeah. Paint, you have exactly. to do, you have to clean the street. You have to, but Minta, I, well, I did many other things just because I, I'm enthusiastic. Uh, I, I did things way beyond what our department is doing. Yeah, well, just that, because I was, yeah. a, I was a film student and I could appreciate what the, what the director of photography is doing, what the, uh, how do they put the extras together, what is the directing doing. I, that's how after, you learn. After shoot, I went to the editing room to watch. Uh, I did a lot of things, but all of them are in a very, very low. You know what we call go for go yeah. for this go for that go for, <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah go for that go for that i i've had that job on movie set before it's a lot of sitting around watching the truck make sure no one steals stuff 
exactly. Stuff like that. Go for uh, this and go for this. When they cut stuff out back then, but what did they do with all that footage back then? They just throw it away? Is it just okay. garbage or? Okay, well, well, here we have a problem. If it's a studio, uh, you know, some sometimes we, we know also that the, uh, you know, the rating system will cut out some stuff. So we take the movie because we know that the rating system in this type of movies will take out like three or four minutes. The capitation, like I, they took out the decapitation in Revenge of the Ninja. Uh, killing the kid was a little bit longer. The uh, rating mm. system told us you cannot show killing the kid. And, uh, sure. It was a little bit longer, see. So you know that four or five minutes, sometimes three, between three and four or five, six minutes will go out because of the rating, no, not mm. to get x ray And some is the company, and sometimes it's just tightening the scene. Within the scene, you know, cutting. Sure, sure. Now, in a, when you're talking about in a big organized company, they keep all the material from every movie. We are talking major, uh, let's say Universal, MGM, Warner Brothers. They keep everything. They keep everything, they send it to vaults. And that's why you see sometimes uh, Francis Ford Coppola has a director version. Mm. They go back to the material, they find everything, they know exactly where the negative is. Gotcha. Canon was working with one or two film laboratories. Usually they keep the negatives, the film laboratory in vaults, special, uh, you know, air-conditioned vaults. vaults. So if it was MGM, when, when they used to work with the MGM laboratory, everything was in MGM. Later, they worked with another laboratory, which is called Photochem, and everything was there. And, uh, but I don't know what was the arrangement. I know that Canon at the time, they have their own warehouses, and they kept like wardrobe from the movies, props, everything. At the end of the movie, everything comes back to the office. So they had warehouses and they kept everything. And whatever you cut out and you're not used in the movie, it's called takeouts, which is it's, it's somewhere. Let's say you take out the scene, it's put in a box somewhere, you know, because we used to cut everything. Uh, it was not digital, everything was film. Sure. It was a work, uh, it used to be called work print was a positive not a negative but used only for working for editor so if eventually a scene let's say scene number 302 is not used they roll it on a they put it on a roller they put it in the boxes with all the trims and all the whatever is needed they mark the box and they put it aside so this scene is not in the movie but it's in the box physically because everything was filmed uh, the the final movie there is something which is called negative cutter. And the negative cutting is cut only to the final movie, whatever is decided. So scenes which didn't make it in a box, the negative is still in the laboratory, in the, in the vault, nobody is touching them. Now, obviously, when the laboratory is keeping the material of every company in the vault, it's like rental. The company pays every month. Now, here we come to the end of Canon. The end of Canon was bankruptcy. Canon ended up in a bankruptcy court. So everybody took a piece of the company. MGM was one of the biggest creditors. So MGM took a lot. MGM got all the ninja movies and many, many, many movies. And they already had the material over there. Some other movies and other property. Now my guess, my guess is that once the company dissipated, Nobody paid the rent anymore on the vaults and the warehouses. So. And maybe, you know, like the owner of the warehouse, after three, six months, nobody paying, he just threw it, everything to the garbage. Oh. Those today were all the outtakes. So there are a big followers now about, let's say that there is a big follower group for the Ninja 3, the domination is a cult movie. Uh -huh. And there is a lot of demand because we know about some scenes that didn't make it into the movie. The full scenes, not, not snippets, but really full scenes that we decided in order to match the, to, to, to meet the 95 minutes demand. And maybe they were not the best, we took them aside. And we put it probably in some boxes, I don't know. And now people are looking for them and talking with MGM. There is those, those people, that the enthusiasts who are looking for them. MGM are trying to find them, nobody knows where they are. It began with a celebration, shattered by brutal violence. Until Michael Dudikoff, 
star of American Ninja, became the avenging force. On the script, you know, they gave me the script as it was written, no changes. So in the script, yeah. because it was Chuck Norris, which I didn't know, it was his daughter. But Michael was too oh. young. Oh. In the movie. So oh, I changed, oh. I asked Steve to change it to a sister. Uh, to uh, gotcha, uh, gotcha. Jim, oh, Jim Wood. And uh, in the original oh, script, it was a father and a daughter. Just uh, being in a swamp with the gators and the, the rain and the water. The, the young actress who played Matt Hunter's sister, I believe her name was Allison Garrity. I was curious if, because uh, that was her only movie that she did, was that shoot really tough on her? Do you remember at all? And she just decided she didn't want to act anymore after that? Because it seemed like a really difficult shoot, especially for such a young actress. She was a local from New Orleans. She was not an actress who came from Los Angeles. There was a double for her professional double, uh, you know, short lady that, that came from Los Angeles. She was part of the team of uh, BJ's team. Many times when you see her, it's really the double, it's not her. But uh, no, she was, yeah, there was no problem. It was probably tough on her. She came in only for close-ups, of course, you know, all the long shots and the wide shot was done by, the, by her double. She didn't have to... But, but yeah, she was in the rain, in the water, inside, inside the swamp, in the water. So, but I don't remember any problem or any complaint. She, she had fun. It's exciting. There is a lot of excitement on the set. You know, you are trying to accomplish myself as a director. I want to put it on film, as we said, put it on the can to make sure that it's inside the camera. The stunt people are excited because they have designed this. The actors are excited because they want to perform and execute the stunts and the, the pieces, pieces of action as best as they can. So they look good on the screen. So there is a lot of hype. There is a lot of excitement. Everybody wants to do it. Uh, we are not in a situation. I don't know in other movies. I have no idea with other stars, with other actors that are, they dread doing action and they don't. But in our case, in all of those ninja movies and action movies, people were very excited about every piece of stunt and the, a lot of anticipation and you build out the, the assistant director, the production manager, the explosion people. The, the, there is a big team who is involved in every, every stunt. And so there is a lot of excitement to make sure that it will look good. And usually there are many cameras. We don't, we don't shoot stunt with one camera just to be safe. If something happened, if we cannot repeat it, so and to have uh, multiple angles, uh, different angles on the, so there are, there are three or four camera crews. And there is a lot of excitement when it comes to action and enthusiasm. I think that that translates really well on screen in your films because I think that probably has a lot to do with you as a director orchestrating everything because I mean you have such a nice energy about you and I, I just think that that um, the, the enthusiasm behind the camera from the cast, the crew, uh, the stuntmen, the stunt coordinators that translates on screen. I mean you feel it. You feel the enthusiasm in the action, in the performances. I think that has a lot to do with you because you seem to be such an easy person to work with. Everyone says you're always listening and always communicative on set and like I think that that translates well on film. There are many things that a film director has to to accomplish but one of them is to lead the team to to create the atmosphere and enthusiasm if you need or somber uh, atmosphere on the set, whatever the director sees the right thing to do. But it's his uh, responsibility, the director's responsibility and job to create the, the atmosphere on the set that will eventually translate to what we see on the screen. As you say, I, I like to get the crew involved. Uh, this is the, the style of my directing that I, 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 first of all, I encourage the crew to come up with crazy stuff. Even, you know, many times there is this question of the budget and schedule. And my, my style was always, don't worry about schedule, don't worry about budget, let me fight about this. You guys try to come up with the most elaborate thing that you think you can come up with, the most exciting piece of action that you can come up. Don't worry about budget, not budget. If the production manager or the producer will veto it, let me fight with the production manager. Don't, don't you guys worry, not the stunt crew, 
not the special effect crew, not the, the vehicle uh, department, and not the weapon department. You know, I instill this feeling, assurance among the, the crew that they can go as crazy as they want or as, as, as elaborated and fancy as they want. And sometimes we are able to achieve it, sometimes we are not able to achieve it. And again, you're right, I'm listening to them, I, I encourage them. I, and, uh, I might come with some crazy suggestions once in a while and, and create this atmosphere that let's do it. Everybody should be happy, enthusiastic, uh, trying to achieve the goal, which is to eventually engage, eventually at the end of the life, engage the audience in the theater or at home, engage them in exciting, uh, type of entertainment. So, yes, maybe. <laughs> Thank you for the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't just compliments. I mean, you, your energy seems to uh, permeate throughout your productions. And they, you know, everyone that works with you seems to want to work with you again, seems to love you. I mean, and, and you always hear about directors on certain sets being somewhat of dictators and trying to control everything. You seem to be really embracing film as a collaborative piece. Right. You know, I mean, even with our production, which is small for Retrofine Radio, I mean, you know, I, I love, I have you on film telling me, you are the filmmaker, I am your tool, which I love. <laughs> I was like, I got, you know. But, but, I'm, <laughs> but I mean, I'm sure that there is a different, many different styles of uh, uh, conducting a movie set. I'm sure from, sure, sure. from uh, you know, there are stories, I don't know, people say Hitchcock found this, the filming of the movie the most boring part of making movies. <laughs> he, he, in his interview, he's telling that the entire work was done when he was sitting at home on, with papers and preparing, and then he came to the set. For him, it was already done in his brain, and that this was the most boring part of the, making the movie was on the set. And other people, I don't know, I hear, I hear stories about Michael Wiener that was total dictator on the set. Wouldn't allow yeah, anyone to too. say one word or do anything. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I did not witness, you know, directors don't meet directors at work. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's sure. a lonely job. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. In many countries, you will see in Germany, American fighter number two is Avenging Force. They got very confused. <laughs> uh, you know, when American Ninja came out, there were martial arts were popular already around the world. The Hong Kong martial arts. Nobody in the West ever heard the ninja idea. Uh, what is Ninja? So the first movie, Enter the Ninja, came out, was a moderate success. Revenge of the Ninja was much, much uh, more successful. When American Ninja came out, in many countries in Europe and around the world, they didn't know how to, how to chew it, how to swallow it, what to do with it. In many countries in the world, American Ninja is called American Fighter or American Warrior. Uh, mm -hmm. Even in Spanish, uh, Americano, Gerardo Americano. In France, it was American fighter. Uh, in Germany, American warrior. Then suddenly comes this avenging force, which you don't have to use the word ninja. So it's fine. It's perfect. So it's American fighter number two. <laughs> Not a ninja, a fighter. <laughs> suddenly comes American ninja number two. They were so confused from a distribution <laughs> point of view. Uh, yeah, sure. So in every country in the world, you go to Sweden, you go to France, they, they resolve it. it the distribution resulted in some other way. And in the countries that they did not call American Ninja, they did not use the word Ninja, they they were able to just call it American Fighter number two, instead of Avenging Four, to commercially ride on the success of American Ninja. I get it now, because there's the, the, the Ninja trilogy. But when I was a kid, Ninja Three, The Domination, I remember I was confused. I was like, what? where's Ninja One and Two? Like, I didn't realize it was Enter the Ninja and Revenge of the Ninja, you know? I will tell some anecdote that adds to this confusion of the, this movie. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I, I, it explains it. Okay. Canon Film was a small company that, you know, started and became what they, they eventually called Canon Mini Studio. They produced a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. Starting from Revenge of the Ninja, they had a good distribution relationship with MGM. MGM was a good established distributing company. So all of Canon film, all of Canon film went directly to MGM for distribution, including American Ninja including Breaking and Breaking 2 Electric Bullet. Now, those two movies, Breaking 2, made a lot of money in distribution. Now, as usual in Hollywood, when it comes to dividing the profit of distribution, lawsuits and fighting starts. Canon 
claim that so much money, that MGM owes them so much money and MGM claim that they don't, whatever was the dispute between them over uh, distrib distributing the breaking movie, American Ninja movie, some Chuck Norris movie, whatever. So Canon at that point, exactly before Avenging Force came out, they decided to break away from MGM and to create their own domestic distribution company. Canon was not distributing movie. Canon was only selling movie. It was, it's called sales organization. They sold movies to MGM. They sold movies to other distribution companies around the world. They did not distribute the movie themselves. So over this, uh, after this dispute with MGM, they decided to create their own distribution company. And the first movie that they put in line, in the pipeline to distribute was Avenging Force. At that time, they were not experienced at all in distributing movies and uh, kind of MGM, because of the distribution, on the right to the title American Ninja. They cannot use American Ninja. That's why American Ninja 2 is distributed through MGM because you, they couldn't do it because of contractual. But Avenging Force, they felt they can do by themselves and they distribute themselves. So suddenly it became messy. With, when everything came to MGM, MGM would make all the distributional decisions in North America and pretty much around the world. The world follow what happens in North America. And suddenly it was a mess. There was a mess. Suddenly there were Canon movies, MGM movies, uh, from a distribution point of view. I'm not talking about the uh, product, production. And that's yeah. one of the reasons for the confusion of the name. And this, gotcha. by the way, one of the reasons for uh, that this movie was not that successful because suddenly not a big company like MGM was distributing it, but this much smaller company, Canon Distribution, was distributing it. River Bend, Georgia, 1966. A timeless community where nothing changes. There'll be some trouble if you come to town this morning. Buggers, I'm warning you! You can't just go and kill a Negro. Times have changed. Now, we all know what happened to Marcus. Now, there's the example of a man going to the law. And God damn it, look what happened to him. Now, come on out here, boy. I want to talk to you. I'm doing the talking. I'm going to take care of this now. If you really are what you say you are, help us protect ourselves. Or show us how to do it. I don't ever, ever want to hear the words, boy, nigger, or colored used again. Understood? Yeah. Only one man can teach them to fight. The next time we meet, the town will be ours. I just had a small question. I know River Bend probably co consisted primarily of night shoots. Is that something that's more difficult than day shoots? I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Night shooting has two elements to it. First of all, you deal with lights all the time. With heavy, if it's outside, big lights, heavy lights, so that the lighting crew is much bigger than regular. Uh, today, they're, they're much more advanced in the lighting equipment at the time. You need huge, huge units to light exteriors. So, of, so it takes more time. So there is a lot of time concerning. Another problem with the night shoot, there is a shift. Usually there is day shooting and then you shift to night shooting. And, and let's say we start at seven o'clock every day from seven to seven. <laughs> Around three o'clock people are dead tired, you know, because of uh, jet lag. Yeah, so usually the pace, at, at some point in the, at, at, or the end of the night, people are slow and everything looks mm -hmm. slow. And that's why when the assistant director or myself has to rally the people and kind of keep a boost and, and keep everything moving so it doesn't die. So, uh, so those two elements, the, the physical change you have to work we are not used we are not people you know we are not people who work shifts in factory we are not used to this suddenly to work into three o'clock four o'clock everybody is like and <laughs> dying and uh, including the actors the extras everybody so this is the main the main difficulty is uh, it's this physical stuff if you shoot a movie for four or five weeks nights then everybody gets used Everybody shifts, sleep during the day, and work at night. But uh, that, that's the difficulty. The other problem is just lighting, a lot of light. You have to deal with lights because uh, during the day you're lucky. You have the sun, shade or whatever. Here you, you want to light a square, it's 
tons and tons of lights, lighting units, and it takes time, a lot of hours that nothing to do, just wait for the lighting people to finish that. Sometimes they start, you know, they know they start during the day, they have to set up the lights, the cables, the generators, but uh, this is a physical problem to, uh, to shoot at night. But that's all. Otherwise, uh, night, night shooting is exciting. What you see on the screen is, uh, is more dramatic. Usually, night, night shooting. I don't like, physically, uh, personally, I don't like night shooting. But, but you have to do it. Uh, there is a lot of an American Ninja. There is uh, like at least one or two weeks of night shooting. And here there was a lot. Now, now you reminded me, I forgot. You reminded me there was a lot of night shooting. Yeah, it really adds just to the atmosphere of the overall, you know, the tone of the film. Night of the year. The most gripping and entertaining film I've seen in many months, maybe years, 10 plus, Gary Franklin, KCBS TV. John Voigt gives a fiery performance. Janet Maslin, The New York Times. A sensational picture, intense and brutally powerful, variety. The best action movie of the year, Jan Herman, New York Daily News. Exciting, powerful, and thrilling as anything I've seen in years. John Corcoran, KABC-TV. It's a success, a super thriller. Michael Wilmington, The Los Angeles Times. Canon had a good movie suddenly. They did not, you know, they didn't know what they were doing. And suddenly they had a good movie, Runaway Train. Good reviews. What do they do? It was an action company. So they print 800 prints. And the, the entire advertising, the entire campaign of Runaway Train was action, action-like, you know, which the first weekend can make a movie or kill a movie. So they open it with a lot of television advertising, portraying it as an action movie. The action crowd comes in the first weekend to the theater. It's not an action movie. It's a, it's a philosophical movie, metaphorically about life on a runaway train. Whoa, they were disappointed. After one week, the movie dies. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent movie. Anyway, the action crowd was disappointed. Didn't go. A movie like this, you open slowly. You try to convince the people in art houses in, that it's not an action movie. And then the word of mouth and people and critic and you build critic and you go to festivals and you show it in a prestige festival. And then you eventually open it 80 theater, 80 prints, no more this type of runaway train, you know, 80, 100 maximum. But you don't open it with 600, 800 theater. It's not the type of movie. And they killed, they killed runaway train, basically, by, by the wrong distribution. It's the best, the best movie Canon ever produced was runaway train. The, the, no doubt about it. They tried many things, but this is, the, this is the most, the best movie they did. They escaped together. They battled the elements. They achieved the impossible. Smile, man, we're free! But their train to freedom was out of control. Brake shoes have burned off. The overspeed control must have gotten screwed up. Engineers do not just croak. You want to be a tough guy? You want to be a legend? Go back! Sucker, come on! They ain't getting caught alive. Let's have some fun. <laughs> You'll never stop this, friend. You hear me, Reckon? Never! I'll kill you, man. You die, sucker. Don't make me kill you. Shut it down, man. He got shut it down. Their struggle for freedom became a fight for their lives. John Voigt, Eric Roberts, Rebecca de Mornay, and Andre Kontolowski film. Runaway Train.